winning cures everything. Here are your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything, number 107. This is the Tuesday, August 1st edition of the show. I'm Gary. I'm Chris. On today's show, we're going to discuss some of the streaks that are ongoing in SEC football leading into this season, and we'll talk about how long each one is going to last. We'll then bring in Ross Dellinger, LSU beat writer for The Advocate in Louisiana. He's going to preview LSU's season, talk about expectations in year one for Coach O, along with what the media thinks of being shut out of fall camp. Uh, We'll then discuss Alabama defensive lineman Deshaun Hand being arrested for a DUI over the weekend. We'll discuss the absolute biggest farce of a firing in the history of NCAA coaches, and it happened in the the SEC uh, back, what, 25, 30 years ago? Uh, However long ago this was. Almost 30 years ago. Almost 30 years ago. We're going to touch on UFC 214. Former Memphis Tiger basketball player DJ Lawson was suspended from the team at Kansas. We're going to discuss more Ole Miss talk, et cetera, et cetera. But first, let's do the rundown so you know how you can contact us. Website is winningcureseverything.com. You can give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. You can follow us on Twitter, at winningcures. You can follow myself, at GaryWCE. You can get Chris. Chris B. Giannini. Uh, That is (laughs) C-H-R-I-S-B-G-I-A-N-N-I-N-I. You can also email the show, winningcureseverything at gmail.com. You can get us on podcast like you're listening to right now. Give us a review on iTunes. We need five stars, and we need you to write something. Make it pretty. Make it snappy. Make it cool. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play. And we're on Local X, Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m. That's LocalXRadio.com or the Local X app. Today's show is being brought to you by Kyle Seeger's Designs. If you need great, affordable web design for your company, business, or just personally, like say you just want to put a resume up, something like that, you can do it there. Check out kyleseegers.com. He can handle all of your web development needs, including site building, maintenance, branding, and more. For more information, visit Kyle Seeger's Designs at kyleseegers.com. Chris, since we're gearing up for football season, I... I'm going to go through a list of streaks. Now, this is thanks to Reddit College Football. If you haven't seen the Reddit College Football site, it's awesome. There's new stuff up there all the time, just different facts, different ideas. and Totally random that. stuff, yeah. but it's really cool. It's really cool stuff just to get your mind working. So, I want you to tell me if these streaks are going to end this year. That sound good? Now, some of this, some of this you shared with me earlier. Some of it, I need to know where they play this year. That'll be the only question I don't know. Okay, I can I can look that stuff. But up. we'll roll. All right, number one, Florida has won thirty straight against Kentucky. That's a long streak. Thirty straight. Will that end this year? I think if it's in Lexington, it is. I think it is. I think it will because it, just statistical fact, man, beating somebody that long, and Kentucky's on the rise. If you're gonna play the spoiler, which I I think Kentucky can, I think you gotta win. You got to beat somebody who's beaten you yeah, 30 times in a row. I agree. And, I, you know, I, I do wonder, um, and I don't have it right in front of me, I think it's an early season game, oh, that, that which helps awesome, out though. Kentucky yeah, even more so because yeah. they're super experienced. And that is something that, uh, that's right. that Florida is not, especially at the quarterback position. So, you know what, I'm pulling it up right now. Let's see. Um, I do think, I do think it's early in the year. But I don't know exactly when. I think it's it maybe how how early would be early enough for you to call that upset. I think I'm gonna call the upset anyway. Just just for numbers, it's just a numbers game, man. I mean, you roll the roulette wheel, eventually it's gonna come up red. It's just it's gonna happen. Well, they play Saturday, September twenty third. Oh wow, week That's four, week four, yes. And it's the week after Florida plays Tennessee. Okay, so you're gonna take it. You think Kentucky ends it this year? Man, I think so. I think Kentucky's really close to being good. And if they're not going to be good this year, when the hell are they going to be good? Alabama has won 10 straight against Tennessee. Oh, that's going to keep happening. No it's chance. in Tuscaloosa this year. No, no it doesn't matter. We played on the moon. <laughs> Butch Jones, I, I'll mark this down right now. In any comp- competitive thing, Butch Jones would never beat Nick Saban. I think you might be right. All right, well, let's stay on Alabama. Number three, Alabama has won six straight against LSU. It's in Tuscaloosa again this year. I th- I think Alabama's probably going to win that. I, but I also think Bama's not going to go undefeated. 
We talked about that with Funny Main last week. And I think the only two chances they're really going to lose is going to be to LSU or Auburn. So, man, we got a coin flip of beating them, but I just don't. Man, we're yeah. starting a whole new coaching staff. The expectations need to be realistic for LSU. Number four, LSU has beaten Texas A&M every year since they joined the conference and also the last year they were in the Big 12. That is six straight wins. I Does think they keep... still keep rolling on that. Okay. And that's not just a home now you, you had Someone's pl- going to struggle. When we did our, our summer predictions, mm-hmm. you had picked Texas A&M to win that game. That's because I picked LSU to beat Bama, and I wanted them to go 11-1 and because I didn't think they'd ever go 12-0. and That's totally a homer thing. Well, I think I think we may go back and read it because we didn't know Hugh Freeze was going to be gone, well, all that. I didn't so. pick Ole Miss to win a lot of games anyway. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> um, but we, we may go back and redo that and just kind of – Well, obviously, we made, yeah. the, we made those picks – a long, that's, like in that show June was, or whatever. That show was recorded way sooner than it was That's aired. That's true. That's true. Um, the home team – oh, no, I'm sorry, LSU again. Yep. LSU has not – this is number five. LSU has not lost to Auburn in Baton Rouge since 1999. That's eight straight home wins. Man, I, everybody's telling me Auburn's going to be good this year. Everybody tells you Auburn's pretty good a lot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna be the homer. I'm gonna screw that. I'm gonna be the homer. No, yeah, we're gonna keep that streak going. We're beating Auburn. All right, let's stay on Auburn then. Number six, the home team has not won the Texas A&M Auburn game since A&M joined the conference. That is five straight wins for the away team. That is really weird. That yeah. The, that the road team in home field advantage in the SEC is so big, and it doesn't matter in that game. And it's it's in A&M this year. I'm, let's roll with it. If A&M's gonna be bad, they'll be bad. Okay. So you you think we're gonna. It'll Auburn's be six supposed straight. to be good, so okay. let's do it. Mississippi State has not beaten LSU in Starkville since 1999. Yeah, up until the, a couple of years ago where they beat us in Baton Rouge, it was over 20 years that Mississippi State hadn't beaten us. Yep, So, and that's the only reason they that, won that one is because of Dak. That's right. Well, and, and LSU's just – that was the bottom of the barrel of offense. Yes. That really was the lowest point of offense in, in the history of LSU. I think we started another 20-year streak. We're just not on the same level as State. I, I agree. They don't have a Dak Prescott. And everybody wants to say Nick Fitzgerald is great. No. But I just, until he shows it against a decent team, you know, I haven't seen it against a team with a pulse. That's right. Um, number seven, no, I'm sorry, number eight, A&M has beaten Arkansas every year since being in the SEC. That is five straight years. Man, that's wild. I wouldn't have guessed that either. It's, it's close every year. I think they lose that. I, I'm higher on Brett Bielman than everybody I listen to. And maybe, like I said, man, I, I might be wrong because I'm going against the grain on most of these. <laughs> I think Brett's a good coach. I think, yeah, I mean, he is. He's going to beat him this year. Brett's getting off the hot seat. All right, all right. Number nine, Will Muschamp boy. has never lost to Tennessee as a head coach. He's got four wins at Florida and one at South Carolina. He's still streaking. Still streaking. You he, think so? He won't keep. Look, man, I just don't put a lot of faith in Bush Jones. I, I can tell that. All right, well, this, we'll stay on Tennessee then. Okay. Tennessee has lost 13 straight games to the SEC West. They have lost to every single team in the Western Division, plus Alabama every year since 2011. This year they have Bama and LSU rotates to it. Right. LSU is in Knoxville. We have to go to Knoxville. And Alabama is in Tuscaloosa. Do yeah, they win know. one of those games? No. Not a chance. Not a chance. That's the LSU homer in me. There's a really good chance LSU it, go to Knoxville and lose. Probably. Don't say Probably. I mean, it just the LSU way that you're talking about. LSU favored in that game. LSU is favored in eleven out of twelve. They're gonna be favored in that game. That's a yeah. We'll bring that up to Ross next. That's right. All right. That's it. Coming up next, we're bringing in Ross Dellinger, LSU beat writer for the Advocate. Right after this, on Winning Cures Everything on Local X. This is Gary Seegers from Winning Cures Everything, and I know you're looking for new gear for college football season. If that's the case, check out the new online store at WinningCuresEverything.com. We've got new WCE shirts in all sizes with all your favorite SEC colors. Just click on the store tab at winningcureseverything.com. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris. Joining us right now is the LSU football reporter for The Advocate down in Louisiana, Ross Dellinger. You can follow him on Twitter, at Ross Dellinger. Ross, thank you so much for taking the time to come in and discuss some LSU football with us. No problem. How are y'all? Oh, cannot complain, cannot complain. Uh, let's let's jump right into the fire right off the bat today. Late last week, Coach O announced that he is closing off all of fall camp to the media. 
He then revealed that in-season practices are still going to be open starting August 21st. Now, LSU is the only SEC team to not have any of fall camp available to media members. Was this a complete surprise to you, and does it make your job that much more difficult, or is there really no difference? Well, um, yeah, the first, you know, the I guess LSU considers camp to be three weeks long. Um, so the first day of school is August 21st, and that's basically when camp ends, and that's when he'll open up practices. So for the first three weeks, um, yeah, we won't get any practice access. And it certainly makes our job more difficult. You know, we're supposed to be uh, experts on the team if we can't see the team practice just a little bit, uh, just to see where – people are practicing and, and how they're practicing. It, it certainly makes things, uh, you know, a little more challenging for us, but at least we are let in, um, you know, starting uh, the 21st of August and that'll be good. And, and that, that, um, you know, he just, his reasoning behind closing the first three weeks is mainly LSU's new offense. I mean, they're putting in a brand new scheme and I think he wants, um, you know, all that time free of distraction so uh, they can concentrate on that. And uh, that's certainly his his prerogative. You know, he can <laughs> he, he gets paid three and a half million dollars to win games. And if he thinks closing the first three weeks of practice will help him do that, then I guess uh, go right ahead. You know, but it does make our job a little challenging in some respects. Gotcha, gotcha. And it's one of those things where, it, you know, with Nick Saban, it was always partially closed. A lot of coaches do – uh, it, you know, the first 15 minutes of practice, right? Or first 15 minutes of camp, whatever it is, 20 minutes. And that way you get to see walkthroughs and, and whatnot. And with this, they have just completely cut it off. So as far as depth chart and whatnot goes, you're not going to know any of that until until they give it to you, basically, right? Yeah, you know, we'll, um, we actually we released a full depth chart this past weekend, but it's it's very much projected and it's based on – what we saw in spring practice and our conversations during the summer with coaches. Um, I think it's somewhat, I hope it's somewhat accurate, but we won't know really for sure until, you know, we get led into practice in about three weeks. We'll have a better idea then. Gotcha. All right. Now, Matt Canada and Dave Aranda are both highly regarded coordinators. You've gotten to be around Aranda for a full season and now two off seasons. Canada was great last season at Pitt. His reputation caught fire with what he was able to do at Pitt's, or with Pitt's offense. But people forget that he was let go by NC State following the 2015 season. And my question is this. Are these two coordinators that look to be in Baton Rouge for the long haul? Or is LSU just kind of biding time until one or both of these guys end up with head coaching opportunities? Well, you know, a few years ago, maybe two or three years ago, Matt Canada was a finalist for – at least one uh, head coaching job. I think it was at um, uh, East Carolina. So yeah. he obviously wants to be a head coach in college football. And I think it's something, especially if he has success this year um, with an offense that's, especially a passing offense that's struggled over the last few years, if they have a lot of success in this first year, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he lands somewhere. And I think LSU kind of expects that. As gotcha. far as Aranda, he's a bit different. I don't much. I'm not sure he really wants to be a, a head coach in college. Now, that could change. But I could see Dave Aranda eventually becoming an assistant on the NFL level, uh, specifically a defensive coordinator. Gotcha. So he, he's more looking towards professional football as opposed to sticking down in college. Right, exactly. Okay. All right. Well, that kind of leads us back into uh, Coach Orgeron. He's, he's doing all the right things to fire up the fan base. There are some things that have led to some outside criticism, whether it's closing camp to the media or, you know, blocking other big schools like Texas from uh, from satellite camps in the state. Is Coach O capable of staying in Baton Rouge for 10 years, or or is this maybe a pressure cooker in the SEC, even on his second go-round, that, that he won't be able to handle? Well, you know, I, Ed says that he has changed from from the guy that, that uh, failed in, in three years and that old mess. And uh, he claims he's, he's changed. He's a different guy. He, he learned a lot. He says from that time at Ole Miss and uh, he's going to use it uh, in, in Baton Rouge to, uh, to be successful. And uh, you know, I just, it, it's tough to say if he really has changed and, and we've seen some of the things that he's done in the off season. And it does, you know, it's, it, he's acted differently certainly uh, than he did at Ole Miss, I think. Yeah. And um, 
But but you know, until the season gets here and until you start you start maybe losing a couple of games, uh, you really not you really don't know exactly how much he has changed. We're going to see come the season, but there's no doubt that he knows what he did poorly at Ole Miss, and uh, he knows um, that he needs to do you know kind of the opposite in a lot of ways, the opposite. Uh, and one of the big things is letting his coordinators and letting his assistants kind of do their job and not meddle too much, you know. And, and that's kind of what we've seen this off season. But, again, until the season gets here and, and you're maybe on, you know, a two-game losing streak or something or, or you've, lost, you know, you've won five straight and you're entering a big game, you know, um, or it's that fourth down in the fourth quarter or something, uh, it just we, – we won't see it, I think, for sure – we won't know if he's changed for sure, uh, you know, until until the middle of the year, I think. It, now, the biggest question going into fall camp, and, and this will play a lot into, you know, what Ordron is able to accomplish this year. It, and it's been this way for years down there. It, it's always the quarterback, right? Skill positions, the lines, the secondary all appear to have good quality depth. Does, any, uh, does Danny Etling provide the best quarterback play they've had at LSU in quite some time, or did we kind of see last season exactly what he's capable of? Well, I think Danny provides stability at, at a, a, a position that has not had that stability over the last probably three years, really since Zach Mettenberger left in 2013, uh, 2014, 2015, and at least part of 2016. You had just kind of a shaky position. You you, you know you had a an, an, a lot of times an inaccurate starter. Danny's a really smart kid and. Um, He's uh, he makes good decisions most of the time, and uh, he's he's pretty accurate, yeah. and so he kind of gives you a lot of what you didn't necessarily have the last few years. Um, you know, the big question entering camp is how how much improvement can Danny have under Matt Canada in in year one, and uh, can he make can he become kind of that playmaker that that guy who we didn't see that last year from Danny he was he was more the game manager but some some games he's going to need to be that playmaker and uh, that kind of remains to be seen if if he is uh if he's going to be able to do that well it seemed in big games last year that they kind of they tried to hide him a little bit and I don't know if that had to do with injuries or what but say you know the Florida game or the Alabama game where you know you just needed one big play and they couldn't seem to to dial that up. It seemed like they were just hiding the playbook and playing really close to the vest. It, is that something we'll see differently this go round, or or does he have the capability of doing that? Well, I, you know, if Ed Orgeron lets Matt Canada, you know, do his own thing, yeah, Matt has been described as kind of a fearless guy, a, a fearless coordinator in a lot of ways, and, and a guy who's going to. Um, He's going to, you know, if he, he sees a weakness of some kind in a defense, he's going to try to exploit it. And, and he's going to, he, I think he calls plays, you know, in that kind of fearless mentality. So, uh, but at the same time, he's, he's only going to do, and he's only going to call plays, um, you know, he's going to specify, I guess, different plays for different quarterbacks depending on their skill set. And uh, I think that, um, you know, Danny has a certain skill set, and I don't think you're going to see, Matt Canada push it too much, so uh, it kind of remains to be seen exactly, you know how how um, I guess how risky they're going to go. But it, it all kind of depends on Danny Danny Etling's progression. Um, and, and last year, to get back to one one of your questions about last year and sometimes being conservative, I, I yeah, you know Danny was battling a back injury uh, that was you know pretty tough. I think he was in a lot of pain. His his left leg would go would go numb sometimes and he he got that fixed in april so i think that had a lot to do with with some of the play calls last year too gotcha gotcha now tell me about the defense i know arden key is back and there's only five starters returning uh you've got three of them in the secondary the line looks like a there's a ton of talent with the linebackers and uh on the defensive line it are they because there is so much talent do you see any kind of a drop off for uh, for Randa's defense, so it's definitely going to be you know. And I was trying to said this. It's definitely going to be some growing pains early in the year because um, the defense is going to be, as you mentioned, you know, only five, four or five starters back, and uh, they're they're going to be some growing pains. 
they're going to have some young guys, some true freshmen even, probably rotating. I mean, by the end of the season, and Ed Orgeron has, has mentioned this too, by the end of the season, I think he believes seven true freshmen could be rotating in uh, on LSU's defense. And uh, that's a lot of uh, – that's a lot of rookies, and so you're going to have some growing pains early in the year, and uh, it, it kind of sets up for LSU to to have those. Uh, you know, they, they they start off with BYU and Houston, but three of their first five games are at home against non-conference teams, so that'll help. Yeah, yeah, the schedule definitely sets up nicely. Well, let let's go ahead and wrap this thing up. Uh, according to early Vegas lines, LSU's favored in 11 of 12 games this year, and that's with having five SEC road games on the schedule. And, you know, as we talked about, only five starters on defense. Uh, it, there's a ton of talent, like always, on the roster. How many wins would be considered a success in Baton Rouge this year? Well, I think, you know, every year uh, in Baton Rouge, it, it, it seems like you got to win 10 or 11 games. So that's the expectation level. This year, feel, it feels a little different just because you have a first-year coach. You lost three first-round picks. Um, you have a brand-new offense. I think there are going to be some growing pains, and everybody kind of realizes that. I think a successful first year, a pretty strong first year for Ed Orson would probably, you know, be going nine and three or something, uh, you know, somewhere around that in in his you know his first his first year. You got to remember too, you know, LSU's got five SEC road games, and that's something that's pretty pretty rare. You usually have four home games, four road games in the SEC, but because of the Florida postponement last year. Uh, you've got, um, you know, you've got five SEC road games this year. So nine regular season wins would be, I think, a pretty strong for his first year. Oh, absolutely. All right, well, that is, uh, is going to wrap it up. He is Ross Dellinger from The Advocate. Make sure and follow him on Twitter, at Ross Dellinger. Ross, we appreciate you jumping in and uh, getting us up to speed on LSU before the season starts. I, I've got to get you back on again during the season, my friend. All right, no problem. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, buddy. This is Gary Seegers, your co-host and owner of Winning Cures Everything, the best sports blog and podcast in the South. There are a ton of ways that you can connect with us. First, check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. Second, give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. Third, follow us on Twitter, at winningcures, or myself, at Gary, or at Chris B. Giannini. Four, email the show. Winnie Cures Everything at gmail.com. Fifth, download, subscribe to, and review the podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, and all of your favorite podcast apps. We'll have new shows up every Tuesday and Friday morning along with different articles throughout the week. Remember, winningcureseverything.com. Welcome back in to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris on Local X Radio. Now, Chris, you know, we, we went through the streaks thing earlier before we talked to Ross. And one of the streaks that came up was that Florida has won every season opening game dating back to 1989 when they lost to Ole Miss. Now, before we get into it, I, I did some research on it. Because 1989, I was like, that's before Steve Spurrier. Like, who was the coach? And I was six years old in 1989. I didn't know anything about this. Do you know who Florida's coach was? Well, no. No clue. It's, uh, before Steve Spurrier was hired, it was Galen Hall. Mm-hmm. Now, I looked on sportsreference.com to see you know what was up with that 89 season because Florida was 4-1 and one and ranked number 19 when Galen Hall left. Now, yeah, here's that, the... That's strange. The fact that he had yeah, a 4-1 and one record. Like, and ranked in the top 20. What happened? And it, yes, he lost to Ole Miss, but like he had won four games after that. Now, here's the Wikipedia story on it, right? Interim University President Robert Bryan forced Hall's resignation in the middle of the 1989 season during another investigation of possible NCAA rule violations. Now, this is how wacky the NCAA was oh, back this, then. Like, this it's stuff nuts. pisses me off. The new allegations were primarily related to Hall paying several of his assistants out of his own pocket, which violated an NCAA rule that capped salaries, a rule later found to be in violation of federal antitrust laws as well as paying the legal expenses related to the child support obligations of one of his players, allegations that he still denies. The NCAA ultimately slapped the Gators with two years probation, banned him from bowl consideration for the 1990 season. It deemed Hall's alleged violation serious enough that it would have kicked the Gators off live television during the 1990 season as well had school officials not forced Hall's resignation. Hall has not been hired as a college head coach ever since, 
and he wouldn't return to the college ranks again in any capacity for 15 years, prompting later employer Joe Paterno to call him, quote, a good coach who got screwed. No doubt. Now, here's well, the story so, behind it, right? I was so, just like, about to say, so we find that out, and then we dig a little deeper. Yeah, we dig more. I thought, all right, so he helped. That's an impermissible benefit. You can't pay a player's child support while that's kind of honorable. It's not what he did at all. No, no. It's, it's So there's a Sports Illustrated article in October, like it's October 30th, 1989. It's called Gambling, Payoffs, and Drugs. And it talks about all of the different things that were violations and whatnot that went on at Florida. Several years. In the 80s. Yes. And yes. it's basketball and football and just the whole thing, right? Point shaving, cocaine stuff, all kinds of stuff. Yes. Now, so this is Galen Hall's segment in this. And it's just, it's one little paragraph. That's it. That's all he got. And he, he was treated like he was an absolute bum. He broke laws, all this kind of mess. So read through like, here's the thing. Florida's 1989 football season kicked off under this cloud. When things got worse, Coach Galen Hall, who had succeeded Charlie Pell after three games in 84, lasted only five games in the 89 season. The man violated his contract and committed major violations, said Brian. Brian was the... Uh, uh, no, the school interim. president. Okay, yeah, the interim. The interim school president. Uh, in his letter of resignation, Hall admitted that from 86 through 88... He had paid two assistants a total of $22,000 in unauthorized salary supplements from his own funds. An NCAA rule stipulates that only a university can pay an athletic department employee. Hall also acknowledged that he had directed a graduate assistant to drive defensive back Jarvis Williams, who at the time was with the Miami Dolphins, to an unnamed city in January 1987 to face charges of non-payment of child support. The ride constituted another NCAA violation. That's it. That's it. That's it. You you have a charge pending on you, player X. I want you to go turn yourself in and do the right thing, and I'm going to get you a ride. That's an impermissible benefit. And then I have two assistant coaches that were paying in cheese sandwiches, and so I'm going to pay them out of my own pocket, and this is a day and a time where coaches make $50,000, 60000 a year. Yeah. I'm going to pay two people over the course of two years $22,000 out of my wallet. Just so that they can coach with me. I read that. I don't. I told you before we talked about we were going to talk about this guy. I didn't know anything about him. Didn't yeah. exist. It. I know that little bit about him, and he's one of the most honorable coaches I've ever read about in my life. And that that's literally the only information I know about him. And that cost him his job for the rest of his life coaching college football. He got to go back. He he started coaching. In college again, fifteen years. Fifteen later. years what later, was he, doing he was an offen- he was offensive coordinator okay. under Joe Paterno. But here's the thing: he coached in NFL Europe. He was like an offensive coordinator in Germany for like five, six years. That this like he, is, he was. It, it's the weirdest thing. He coached in the Arena League for a year. Well, one of the reasons we've discussed this off air. So let y'all in on how we come up with them, the things you talk about on the show. I know the the Ole Miss stuff brings a lot of attention, and Gary does an unbelievable job of covering it. Ole Miss has mismanaged and mishandled that so badly, it bothers me to even talk about it because it makes me feel like I'm defending the NCAA when I know in my heart of hearts there is nothing defensible about this organization. I find them detestable. Now, this is in 1989, and you could say, well, there are a lot of bad crap going on. You didn't have to be a brain surgeon in 20-something years don't have to pass you by to know a man paying guys out of his own pocket should not cost him a job when he's paying assistant coaches so they can have a halfway decent livable wage. Now, let's let's talk about this first. That broke an antitrust law. Like, he broke the law. Well, no, no, no. He he didn't break the NCAA broke the law because it was an antitrust issue because they couldn't put uh, stipulations on how much how you, you can pay. Well, okay. On how, how much I you can pay you. your assistance, right? Yes. So you can't do that. So it but changed the rule. Yeah, it changed the rule eventually. But, but he, he still lost his job for he it. He lost his job for it. And the reason that he lost his job is because there were laws in place. He thought the laws were wrong. That's right. He still went and did it anyway. And there are consequences when you break rules. You're, you're like exactly it, right it, on Like, that. for example, with Hugh Freeze and Ole Miss and what I, and we're going to talk more yeah. Ole Miss in a little bit, but with with all that, there are laws 
there are NCAA rules set in place. And I when disagree you, with them, but I understand if you get caught breaking them, there are consequences. There are consequences. There are laws that I disagree with personally that I have chosen to break in my life, and if I got caught, I would pay the consequence for exactly. it. Exactly. I and understand same, same that. Same thing with Ole Miss right now where it's like, well, everybody in the SEC cheats. Yes, right. everybody does, but not everybody gets caught. That's right. Like, if they all got caught, then they would all be going through the same thing. And, no, you're not going to be able to catch everybody. But when you play loose with the rules, but when you, you read, run the risk. When you read that about a guy, now he may have been a, a POS – other than this. Everything that I've read about him, he was not. I, you read one article about him, and, a, and we read a Wikipedia page thing about oh, him. Oh, no, no. I mean, I, I did more digging well, I know than that, just but that. I, but, saying, yeah. You just read that to, to all the listeners. That's the amount of information and research that I've done today on talking about this guy. And instantly, I can't name a single college coach coaching today that is that, is that honorable. Oh, yeah. No, I, and I, I agree. And they all make gazillions of dollars more than I guarantee you he made. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. What percentage of his salary did he give away to his assistant coaches that these guys have never given to charity, to their own family, to anybody? And I'm not saying they should, but he was fired for it. And he was run out of town, not just fired for it, but ran out of town. Ran out of the sport. And then you got a guy that didn't pay his child support, and you got a warrant out for your arrest. And so many schools would help cover that up. They would call police and so and so. Or they'd make, get a booster to yeah, go pay his stuff or something. They would make sure that something got swept under the rug. And he was like, "No, you need to you need to go turn yourself in." And I got and I got somebody that'll drive you, yeah. so you can go turn yourself in. And that's a having somebody go turn themselves in to be arrested is an impermissible benefit. Or to at least defend. Well, no, it's I think it was to a. Uh, a to a trial, like uh, to a hearing. It, it sounded like he had to go get booked, like he had to go get processed. Like, not that he's going to spend, like, the week in jail, but the way it sounded was he had to go turn himself in to, to, to at least get processed through this thing. Oh, yeah, you're right. It was to face, well, it yeah, says to face, uh, to face charges of non-payment of child support. Yeah. But the ride constituted another NCAA violation. Now, to, to give a further backstory on this, Florida could have faced the death penalty for this because of what Charlie Pell did back in 84. But that's ridiculous. And that's where the whole thing got a little crazy because these rules violations were just ludicrous. Like, there's no reason that these should have ever been... Against the law? Or against the NCAA rules. Against the NCAA rules, yeah, their law. Yes. that's, That's why I have problems with the NCAA. I, I couldn't cite situations like this, but I heard enough about them growing up. I've just I've never heard a single rule except for the few exceptions that they allow people to do stuff. Yeah. And I'm thinking, why is that an exception? I remember when God, I wish I knew the player's name. Out of Florida State, he was um like a like a notable scholar winner, a road scholar. Yeah, and and in order to receive his road scholar award, it was the same day as a game, a Florida State game, and they allowed somebody to to provide him a private the school to provide him a private plane to go get his road scholar ship award, and then to come back and play in the game that night. And I'm thinking, yes, I understand that that's an exceptional benefit that most people would not get if they weren't athletes, but that's something that we should. Like there shouldn't be a rule against that. We it's, need to encourage. It was Myron Roll. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to say Samari Roll, but I knew that was going to be way wrong. Yeah. Myron. Wrong, wrong. Myron Roll. Yeah. And and we should be encouraging that. We should always be praising that. We should always be lifting that up and doing nothing but rewarding people that that do things like that. We want to. If you want to stand by the name, the fact that you're a scholarship and these are, you know, student athletes, then then never ever ever fight them. You shouldn't have to ask permission. Florida Looking State up on Myron have... Roll, by the way, he's about to begin a neurosurgical Sir, residence at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He, I know he got drafted in the NFL. He got drafted by the Titans in 2010. Yes, and he didn't play long. And he went. I knew he was going to go into like brain surgery. Neurosurgery. Like, neurosur- no, yeah. That's just insane. No, the, the kid is a genius. He's brilliant. Yeah. We we shouldn't have to. The school had to fill out weeks in advance for like all these exceptions and you know, permissions and I shouldn't have to ask your permission. Nope. I've got a plane. This guy's a road scholar. He wants to play in the game that night, but he wants to go get his award that like four people a year get. Yeah. I'm with you. I hate the NCAA. I despise them. 
when schools do dumb things that make the NCAA look right, it really pisses me off. <laughs> I love it. Let's move off that. Let's let's hit a couple of quick fire topics right quick while we're uh, before we get to a break. Um, UFC 214. Did you watch this the other night? I did not, and I'm mad at UFC for while well, I'm getting annoyed at stuff. For just not marketing themselves well. They, yeah, this this fight really should have been marketed a lot better. I didn't know that this fight was happening this weekend. Somebody I had been looking forward to Saturday this. Saturday afternoon, like late Saturday afternoon, said, "Hey, do you want to watch the fight tonight?" Or, "Are you watching the fight?" And I was like, "Dude, man, my my wife's not going to let me do anything. You call me today and ask me to do it. Like that's not happening." <laughs> Isn't it weird how that changes? Like yeah. you you grow up and it's like, "I ah, man, I got to ask my mom." Yeah, right. Now, and then now you got to ask the wife. And then of course, like you go through a spell where you're single and you're an adult and you're like, "I can go do whatever the hell I want to do." That's right. And then you get to a point where you settle down and get married, and it's like, man, you know, i got to ask my wife and anybody who knows my wife knows that she's not that i got to ask. It's a respect thing. Yes, like, 100%. I can't, I, I can't call her or ask her at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, hey, at 9 o'clock tonight, can I leave you and the two kids, you know, with no oh, yeah. preparation, no notice, no nothing. So it's just, it's just no, I just end up missing watching the fight. That's and I'm gone so much anyway because we do this show and That's I've right. got my daughter uh, one night of the week and every other I've, weekend and I'm, yeah I've got all this other stuff going on so if somebody calls me up on Tuesday at five o'clock and says hey man you want to grab dinner at seven it's like nope no I sure can't nope. like there's no but, way but if it's Tuesday and you want to do dinner Friday maybe maybe, maybe just, yeah. just let me ask my wife I got I got I got to <laughs> run it through the chain of command see it's just how it works and and I'm not the commander. I'm, like that's not this. the way it works. The reason I'm bothered by it is I wanted to see this fight before Jones got kicked out of the UFC and went through all the stuff he went through. Yeah, they've been building up this fight for years, literally yeah. years. It finally happened. I didn't know what happened, and I follow sports. Bones smoked him. Yeah, smoked I, him I, I in watched, the third I round. I watched all the highlights. He was, it was it was a fantastic fight. Uh, Tyron Woodley, uh, Woodley. Yeah, yeah. God bless. Um, he was fantastic. Now so he beat Bones, up Damian Maya. I heard Bones called out Brock. He did. Bones did call out Brock. He came out and said, uh, oh, what was it? He was like, uh, Brock Lesnar, if you want to see what it's like to get your ass beat by somebody that's 40 pounds less than you. Yeah, 40 pounds. Brock like, gets your ass in the pounds. octagon. Brock's like 100 pounds. I don't know if he's 100 pounds, but he's. I think he's been weighing in at 260, and Bones weighs like 205. It's still going to be ridiculous. It's, that's that's a big weight class difference. It's a lot, but I, I mean, would you bet against him right now? No, I want to see. The I, fight. I really, I really think he might be the best fighter in UFC. Like well, I really right, think so. right now, maybe. Right I think now. I think he's better than McGregor. I think. He's, uh, well, yeah, but he's a lot bigger than McGregor. Well, yeah, I, I'm he's not even talking lot. about that. I'm just talking about pound for pound. Oh, right? pound, pound for pound, I disagree. I, I'll take a little little guy at a pound for pound fight over a big guy all day long. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. That Bones is awesome. He's he's no, legit. He's, he's bad. Uh, he's Cyborg, bad Cy, uh, Chris Cyborg won her first uh, UFC title. Uh, man, that's a that's a mean looking girl, dude. That's a mean looking girl. Robbie Lawler beat up uh, Cowboy Cerrone, um, and it wasn't bad. It was just you know it was whatever. Uh, and then all the the prelim fights were pretty good. So I, I thought you know this was a pretty good pretty good thing they should have marketed it better i really wish they would have because i was waiting for that bones cormier fight for years yeah like when they first started talking about that and you and i I follow sports and never heard anything about it when they first started prepping that fight years ago i was i was deeper into ufc than i've ever been yeah and then you know it's kind of had its ups and downs and i just didn't even know about it Oh, yeah. I knew it was coming up. Like I knew they had finally he got reinstated, and they were gonna fight. But I had no idea it was Saturday. That's yeah. They they really should have done something differently. A um, little rapid fire here. The Cubs offered Steve Bartman a World Series championship ring. Love Wait, it. You love it. I, I love it. I do. All right, give me give me a reason why. Because I I think it's like they're just giving out World Series rings to everybody. It seems like. I say, I disagree. Here's the reason why. Because that city and that fan base murdered that guy for for yeah. nothing for no, they ruined his life. This is this is punitive damages. This is this is payback for all the years that he suffered. Okay, when li- literally all he did was reach out for a foul ball. He did what instinctively everybody who's ever went to a game that has wanted to catch. A foul and it ball. wasn't his fault that they lost the next two. No, that's that's absolutely insane. It's completely asinine. 
and Cubs fans, and, and they all realized they were ridiculous back then, but Cubs fans and even the Cubs organization, a lot of players, man, they 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 ruined that kid's life. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I think I think they owed him that, and they better dropped off a big-ass check with it and season tickets <laughs> for the rest of his life. I mean, ownership in the team. You can't undo ruining somebody's life, especially yeah. the fact that he was a kid. Like, he wasn't a kid. I mean, he was an adult, but like he was, was still he was young. Yeah, twenty seven. That's a, that. That ain't a kid. I mean, a kid's like eighteen years old. If you twenty five, like, if you reached out for a foul ball at twenty five, and and for the next ten years, your life is just a complete nothing but death threats and well, it, it wasn't. It wasn't a foul ball though. It was a home run. It was a foul ball. No, that was a home run. It was a foul ball. He was on the. <laughs> he was down on the third baseline. That's a, no, there's. A, no, I thought he was in the outfield bleachers. No, how did I? How did I mess this up so bad? I don't know. Like I've, I've, you did what I do a lot of times. But no, it was a foul ball. He was down on the third baseline because the very next play was just. It was just a strike. That's all it was. It was just a long strike. Man, I could have. I could have sworn. Uh you know what? Uh, well, and see, it doesn't say anything in here. Well, well, YouTube it. You can find that. Oh, here it is. Yeah, Bartman reached for the ball, deflected it, and disrupted the potential catch. If Alou yeah. had caught the ball, it would have been the second out in the inning, and the yes. Cubs would have been just four outs away from winning their first National League pennant. Instead, the Cubs ended up surrendering, uh, surrendering eight runs in the inning yes. and lost the game. Yeah. So, he, the, okay. the, kid, You're right. the kid did nothing wrong. And, and I call him a kid. You're right. He's 25 years old. He's an adult. <clears throat> Man... You ruin somebody's life from twenty five to thirty five. Like that is that is the point of life where they are. You are establishing establishing your more career in your life career wise than you've ever grown and becoming the adult you're going to become. And now he's got that. And like that everybody was, knows who Bartman is. And that was destroyed. Yeah. So. All right. It, I'm, I'm with you. Okay. That that makes sense. Uh, last one. Diedrich Lawson suspended from the Kansas team will not make the trip to Italy due to an incident at practice that he did not handle well. Now, let me start off by saying this. They had a kid start for them last year that kicked in a woman's car that had, like, all sorts of anger issues and didn't get suspended. Like, you got to do some serious-ish to get suspended from Kansas. And I think I think that talent level of that kid is way better than Dietrich Lawson. I mean, it, it, that's saying a lot because Dietrich is, you know – He's a five star kid, what, like he's, he's yeah, but he was a five star kid, but he's not a one and done kid. No, he's not an NBA kid. No, you're right, you're right. So I mean, it, it does like there's there's a lot of stuff that's going on at Kansas, and they rarely suspend people. And I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that it's the off season and Diedrich isn't playing this year because he he has to sit out the year for the transfer. Um, but like not taking the kid to Italy like for something. I mean, he he must have done something. Does this vindicate Tubby Smith at all? Yeah, that was my first thought. Was absolutely. That's, I kind of defended Tubby when these guys ran out of town. Well, yeah, both I of was, us did. I was never on the page that Memphis is going to be better without them, but I also think sometimes it's addition by subtraction. And I'm yeah. I'm all for, especially on a team where you start five starters, you have to have some camaraderie. You have to have some chemistry you've got to be able to play together i don't think they had chemistry in memphis at all oh no and so so letting go of 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 guys that are messing that up is never a bad thing i'm with you all right coming up next on winning cures everything we're going to talk to sean hand the alabama defensive lineman who was arrested for dui and the ucf kicker that has just been ruled ineligible to play this year because of a youtube channel so we'll get to that next on Winning Cures Everything on Local X. This is Gary, host of Winning Cures Everything. If you're looking for affordable custom web design, business cards, brochures, and more, check out Kyle Seegers Designs at kyleseegers.com. Kyle offers full website design, monthly site maintenance, and content management system training. Remember, for all your web design needs, check out kyleseegers.com. That's K-Y-L-E-S-E-G-A-R-S.com. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris. Now, let's let's go on and jump into this Alabama thing. Alabama star defensive lineman Deshaun Hand was arrested for DUI early Saturday morning, which, to the youngins, that means sometime after midnight on Friday night. Like, to us old folk, Saturday morning could be like 3 a.m., yeah. right? So, um, 
Now, Chris, what is your knee-jerk reaction when you hear a headline like that? I mean, I'm thinking a kid was out partying. That's that's what you think, right? Yeah. Now, let me read the short article that followed it and, and give you more of a inside thing on it. Because everybody already is, he needs to be suspended for the game, and he needs to da-da-da-da-da, but it, you never know exactly what the situation is, right? Okay. Deshaun Hand was asleep in his parked car and not driving at the time of his arrest, the Tuscaloosa News has learned. The University of Alabama defensive lineman was arrested early Saturday morning for driving under the influence and held on a $1,000 bond. According to Alabama state law, Hand was deemed to be in constructive possession of the vehicle, and although he wasn't driving and the vehicle was parked, the keys being in the car was the determinant that triggered the arrest. Hand was parked in a near-campus parking lot, sitting in the driver's seat with the headlights on and the vehicle cranked, but was asleep with the car in park. The lawful arrest is the first time that Hand has run afoul of Alabama program rules. He serves on the Student Athlete Advisory Committee and was twice named to the SEC Academic Honor Roll. Now, if you don't know exactly what's going on here, if he was drowsy, it you can get a DUI if you refuse a breathalyzer. What do you what do you think of like in this situation? All right, you're I see what you're doing and I get it, but I also understand college kids. Okay. Right. What probably happened was he was probably partying somewhere, tried to drive home. Okay. Yeah. Realized real quickly that he ain't making it real far. He pulled over into a random parking lot and he kicked back and he slept. Yeah. So if he had turned yeah, the car off I, and taken the key out, he would have been fine. He would have been fine. It doesn't mean that he wasn't driving under the influence because he wasn't. I assure you that he wasn't doing whatever he was doing in that parking lot. Oh, agreed. Agreed. So he was out somewhere else doing something, and then he ended up in that parking lot. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that he ended up in the parking lot. He could have parked in that parking lot, and somebody took him back to his car, or whatever. There's all sorts of stuff that could have gone on here. At what point in time does he come out and say these things to tell us what happened? See, that's a good question. This this didn't just happen yesterday. It happened over the weekend. Yeah, it happened over the weekend. Plenty of time for somebody to say, this is what the kid did, this is what actually happened, and and this is what we're going to do. The fact that we're not hearing any of those things tells me he's probably doing what we assumed he was doing. Yeah. And and while it was smart that he realized he needed to pull over, he needed to go to sleep, he's still out partying. He still got behind the wheel of a car. I'm not saying the guy should be murdered for it. I'm not saying you, you, you run him out, on, out of town. But I'm also telling you that DUIs on college campuses are a big deal. Yeah. And I don't think that a one-game suspension is egregious. I, okay, I can understand that. Now, what I, do you what do you think is actually going to be handed to him? I think nothing's going to happen. I, Nick Saban has made it clear, I will handle this in-house. Yeah. Which tells me nothing's going to happen to the kid. Well, something will happen to him, but it'll be in practice nothing, or nothing whatever. Nothing will happen to the kid. But the, the way that it normally goes... They, they run do, bleachers. Do they do all this kind of crap. they're going to condition him any different than they condition him already? Because if they try to condition them more than they already do, they actually cause harm to their body. Because I don't know that it'll be that. Athletes, these college athletes are already pushed to a breaking point, especially during practices right now, during camps. Yeah. So I don't think anything's going to happen. I don't think that you can run somebody physically more than these athletes are about to run yeah. this week anyway. No, I'm with you. I'm with because you. Because this camp is the absolute – and the first couple of days of camp, they don't wear pads. So guess what your ass is doing? Running. Running. Running so, a lot. So I just don't know that they can physically do anything else to him that would actually make him stronger or better. Everything else would actually cause physical harm to him, which means I'd rather just sit you for a game. Yeah. So no, I can understand. I, so I honestly think nothing will happen. That's it. my my guess would be he'd be suspended for the first half if like if there was nothing else besides this and, and yeah I, and I, you're I, right I would and be if completely you completely satisfied with that yeah if if you are a hundred percent right on everything that you said he yeah. probably was driving and pulled over and realized he couldn't drive anymore like if that is the case if he actually was yeah. like if he did have alcohol in his system then probably a half because if he if he didn't have alcohol in the system the first thing the university of alabama and nick saban would make sure it happened is that information gets out yeah he was not driving under the influence he was asleep at the wheel and he was driving home from somewhere for being up too late and he was drowsy and he didn't want to drive while being too sleepy so he pulled over to, to take a nap yeah then nobody would crush him that would be their easiest defense 
but then but nothing has come out yet. Nothing has come out yet. I think nothing coming out is bad news for him. I also think if it was what you gave the example of a friend gave him a ride, the first thing that's going to happen is is somebody's going to say, "Hey, hey, hey, I gave him a ride. We got crazy. I was the DD tonight. His car was parked there. I dropped him off. He laid the seat back. He went to sleep. He turned the yeah. air conditioner on." That's, and, and that's kind of what I was thinking and initially. nobody who lives in the South especially is going to say, oh, you're not sleeping in the car without the car being turned on. Exactly. It's too damn hot. Yeah. So so you're not going to get beat up for that. You're not going to get killed for that. We understand some of these laws are a little crazy. Yeah. And I understand why we have them. But I also know college kids. Yeah. And, and exactly. I'm not saying. And like it doesn't said, matter. It doesn't matter that he was on the. Life. It doesn't matter that he was on the uh, student athlete advisor committee and nobody, named for the academic honor roll. And nobody's all that. He, above making a mistake. Exactly. Nobody. Exactly. This has happened to numerous kids. And, and like, like everybody said, loves Baker Mayfield. Yeah. Well, and and the same thing happened with him. not yeah, same thing, but he Baker, was out public Baker, in talks and Baker could be more of a piece of shit than we're giving him credit for. <laughs> uh, this guy. This but everybody guy loves said, him. They all think he's like yeah, everybody, everybody in Oklahoma. Everybody in Oklahoma. Well, just no. Everybody just national media. Well, that's because he's a pretty they, white boy. He's a pretty white don't, boy, don't and he's super that. nice and all that. I, but I, you get my point. He's you get biased. what I'm saying. This guy right here is proven to be a good kid. He, he, you know, he went out. He had a good time. If I have any assumptions to make out of this, you know, it, I will tell you this: I find it commendable that he pulled over when he realized this is if this is what happened, and he realized, man, this isn't safe. Let me pull on over. That's smart. That's wise because I bet less than two or three percent of college students or anybody that's trying to drive under the influence make a wise decision at some point yeah i agree i agree i'll take this mistake over anything else let's talk about ucf kicker donald de la Haye, who stated that he will not demonetize his popular youtube channel he has now been ruled ineligible but he was ruled ineligible by ucf and not the ncaa now here's the thing if he wasn't ruled ineligible by ucf he probably that would he, be an NCAA violation. It'd be an NCAA violation. Yeah. Because he's making money off of his YouTube channel, and the NCAA has already come out and said, yo, you need to shut this down okay. because you're making money off of being an NCAA athlete. But here's the thing. Like, how much of this is really off of him being an NCAA athlete? Like, I'm sure it is now because everybody knows about it now because we've all talked about it. And, you know, it. it you and I have discussed this prior and it's like he's he's got too good of a job now. Yeah. If, like if you had a seven dollar an hour working at yeah. McDonald's kind of job. If he, if he worked at, at some shoe store, if he went to Foot Locker and made minimum wage during the summer in Florida, nobody would care. But because he's got a good job and he makes good money, all of a sudden now it's a it's a violation. And it's like it's so funny because it's like he's a backup kicker. That's it. Like he's a backup kicker. And he's what got boosters. So I understand you can't have guys getting jobs at certain points because you end up with a lot of boosters. Alabama used to do this back in the day. They would hire, and not that every school didn't, but I actually know people that ran car lots, and they would hire these these recruits. Yeah, that were that were commitments to come work the summer before they started school at their car dealership, and literally they would just sit there all day and sign autographs, take pictures, and. They would pay them large sums of money. Yeah. And they really didn't do anything. I get that that's an impermissible benefit. Like, you can't do right. that. Right. That makes sense. I, but I like actually, the YouTube thing? I actually disagree with it morally, but I understand if you're going to have rules policing this kind of stuff, you can't do that. Right. But if you have a YouTube channel like this, and you're just being goofy, and the internet says, hey, you can monetize this. He's got 92,000 subscribers, which means he's maybe made 15,000 bucks off this thing like over the lifetime of it. This is ridiculous. Like this is it's a little ridiculous. There's Here's no, there's no booster going to his YouTube video and like like boom 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 making making big donations. Yeah, there's no donations to it. No, it's just it's, it's, it's advertising. Yeah. So here's what he told SI back in June. He said, uh, I think uh, the times these rules were made weren't really up to par with what's going on in the real world today. And then he got on Twitter on Monday night and they, I mean, people say he like lit into him and whatnot, but it said, I'm really mind blown. All I wanted was to keep inspiring and motivating others through my content. I didn't know it would cost me my education. There are so many things wrong with the NCAA exhibit A right here. Yep. Like, it, that's 
I mean, it, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, this this whole podcast could just be just us crapping all over the NCAA. But it's I agree. right. I mean, it's there. It, we don't do it because it's fun or because it gets clicks. We do it because they make it easy. Yeah. They do stuff that we deem to be really crappy. And well, so the, we the rules are just kind of – like a lot of them are just dumb. There are some good rules, and there are some that make absolutely no sense – Whatsoever, I get that they have a really hard job if you're going to try to say you can't pay players. But I don't understand. I don't understand where you draw certain lines. I mean, you're back in the day, and I brought this up a bunch using this scenario, but this was just asinine to me to find out this was not an exaggeration. This was an excerpt that a coach used to show impermissible benefits. And they could provide breakfast for recruits. And they could provide them bagels, but if he provided cream cheese, that was that was an impermissible benefit. And I thought, well, that's an exaggeration. That's pretty funny. Like, ha No, no, that was the rule. Like that's that's a literal. That's a that's yeah. a legit rule. And I thought that there's just no way an adult an adult sitting behind a desk making rules to guideline these things can look at that and say with any common sense or logic in their head, yep, I believe that. Yeah. It's it's dumb. The whole and if that dumb. person does exist, then they need to just be thrown out the window. Yeah, and you go to the top window of whatever building you're in and just push them out of it. Yeah, we don't need people like that in society. You're just an idiot. Yeah, I mean I, I'm with you. So, Let, let's let's jump off that. Let's uh, let's take us a little break. We're gonna come back and close this thing out with uh, you know some more NCAA talk, but this time we're gonna talk about Ole Miss and what's going on with their Houston Nut lawsuit. So coming up next on Winning Cures Everything on Local X. This is Gary Seegers from Winning Cures Everything, and I know you're looking for new gear for college football season. If that's the case, check out the new online store at winningcureseverything.com. We've got new WCE shirts in all sizes with all your favorite SEC colors. Just click on the store tab at winningcureseverything.com. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris on Local X. All right, now, Chris, I've got an article up at winningcureseverything.com going through a list of what-ifs because of Ole Miss attempting to keep Hugh Freeze's phone records private, right? Over the weekend, Nuts attorney Thomas Morris talked to Dan Wolken. He explained that Ole Miss is stonewalling him and his Freedom of Information Act request for Freeze's records dating all the way back to June 2012 until now. Now, at first, they told him that he would have to pay $25,000 to the school for the records, because it would take something like 190 hours to go through all of it, and they were going to have to hire third-party counsel to come in and work on it. And by work on it, it means like go through and redact certain numbers and all this kind of crap. That was their excuse for the expense. Now, Mars responded, and Dan Wilkin documented this. He said there's nothing they can do with those records except produce them. There is no reason for lawyers to look at them. They're not allowed to redact them. Phone records are not privileged under any circumstances. For the school. For the school. The and he's school right. phone records are not. He's right. right. The electronic communication policy in the state of Mississippi is pretty simple on it. It reads, employees of the state of Mississippi and the OSA do not have a personal right to privacy in any matter created or received through or sent from a state-owned computer, electronic media, telephone, email system, or voicemail system, as such is the property of the state of Mississippi. Now... Here's where things get hairy. We can go through all of this crap that's in my article because it, just go to the website and read it, winningcureseverything.com. Um, because I, I dive into recruiting and what are the yeah. ties to Yuma, Arizona, because Mars is trying to find records for a burner phone in Yuma. And the only tie there is Jonathan Kongbo, who Ole Miss was recruiting pretty hard. He was the number one defensive end uh, in the country, JUCO defensive end. Um, but on Monday at 3 o'clock, Pat Forty tweeted, Houston Nut attorney Thomas Marsh says Ole Miss tells him phones Hugh Freeze used were paid for by the school's athletic foundation and not the school itself. Now, that's a huge difference, right? Because if that's the case, then the records have to be subpoenaed, and it becomes like a huge deal. It's it's no longer the property of the state. Ole Miss doesn't have to give them anything. Exactly, but it doesn't make a lot of sense because they released some of the records to Marsh before, and that's what led to Freeze resigning from the school with no pay. No pay whatsoever. Now, what what do you make of this? I'm really confused on that part. I feel like 
Is it possible Ole Miss released those records so they could get freeze fired? Like, did they already know this was in there? I think there's. I think there's a little bit of that. I also think that because Hugh's attorneys and Hugh got to look over those phone records and they did redact the personal calls, but they did not. They redact did that. not redact that one. Why, if you were his counsel, if you looked over it and you saw that, would you intentionally not say, well, it may, you could easily say it was a snare, we missed it. And that's, that's what a, he did. That's a hell of a mistake to miss. Yeah, it's, it was that. a less than one minute phone call to you know a Detroit number that he thought was a missed dial because there were no other numbers around. It. Yeah. you know, oh. And if you hired a hooker back in January 2016 and you thought you used your burner phone, yeah, like, yeah, I can understand it, right? Here's my thing. There's a chance, and I've kind of alluded to this some talking about it. There's a chance that Ole Miss's counsel didn't know they didn't have to give them those numbers the first time they did, which caused this this whole escapade a couple of weeks ago. The, the reason it's so weird to me is because it, they may not have known, but why would they have changed up what they have done for their phones right when Hugh got hired, right? So because Houston Nutt was the coach there before him. Hmm. His phone, he's come out and already said, my phone was the state of Mississippi property. Yeah, he might have been like, told that. I'll tell you this. So so there are two there are two things here. One, that should be a very easy thing to find out. We get, we trace back and we say, when Houston was a coach, who paid this phone bill? Like AT&T, AT&T Verizon, Verizon whoever. whoever. Yeah. yeah. Who I want to know, did this come from a secretary from the University of Mississippi? Or did it come from, you know. Or did somebody booster? personally pay yeah. for it? Who paid for it? And that should be a really easy thing to find out. Yeah. You probably have to subpoena that since we don't know if it's state or not. Well, I guess if it's state, then they should have to produce it. Yeah, they should have to. Yeah, if they've got a payment record for it, then yeah. Yeah. And obviously, if you're a state institution, you have those records. Now, then you've got the catch-22 of did the boosters, this athletic group, did they give the money to the school for this purpose and therefore – it's, it's technically state for, funds. But it's state funds. And I think if that's the case, it doesn't matter that it came from boosters. Because realistically, 100% of everything for college football is all paid for by boosters. Yeah. While you Other than the, the however many millions of dollars that come in from TV. Yeah, but, but, but that's, that's, what, that's it. Like it's none of it's none of it's the state of Tennessee's money. None right. of it's the state of Mississippi's money. None of it's the state of Alabama's money. I have friends every year that post these ridiculous things on Facebook and Twitter about the graphs of the highest paid state employee is always some coach, and that tells you what's wrong with education. And and like, these are always people that aren't sports fans, and that's fine. They have a right to their opinion, but they're just dead wrong. Your tax dollars are not paying you freeze five million dollars a year. No, ESPN is yeah, or the it, boosters. or the boosters like like. Nick Saban's making what he's making because the boosters are paying that. The state of Alabama don't have that much damn money. Right. Okay? That's a fact. So, while it part of me says 100% of everything Hughes using is coming from the boosters, so none of it's the state of Mississippi's property. If it's all being funneled through the state, then like it's being state donated property. from the school, and it's going to them, now it becomes the state's property, and you don't get to use that argument. And, and, and that should be a very easy thing for Thomas Marr to figure out. Yeah, I want to see who pays that phone bill, who's paid for it for all of this time, and every month that it was paid for by the university, I don't care where the money came from, then I want those records. I have a right to those records. It's I'm, I'm curious. Like, like I said, what are they trying to hide? Why do they not want him to have these records? And I, I get where it, a civil suit is trying to make the other person look bad, right? I, I think that's what they're trying to do. I think they know. He but if Ole Miss has already cut him out, then, it, I mean, he, his reputation is already completely screwed. Yeah. So, like, what else could they possibly find? Because it's already been said, like, the old, like the school themselves, the administrators said, hey, uh, we found some really disturbing trends in the phone records and – you know that's, and we're not going to tell you what it was, but this but is what's. But if Mar finds recruiting problems, what does that do for his case? It doesn't do anything for his case other than make the school look bad and not just you freeze. Like, and then it becomes an even bigger issue for Ole Miss because then you get a third letter of, of I don't, whatever I don't know notice about anything else. 
I, I, mean, I don't think the NCAA is. It going depends to on how big the auction. NCAA like thinks this violation is. But I think they're done. I think they're going to hammer them. I think they're going to hammer them hard. Yeah. And I think they're not going to send investigators back to Oxford. I think there's a part of me, and maybe it's because this is what I want to happen. There's a part of me that thinks it doesn't matter what gets unfolded. The NCAA is going to tell the Ole Miss attorneys, make all this go away. We're not opening up another investigation. We've done our investigation. We have our information. Anything new that comes out is not going to change our opinion. So yeah. nothing's going to help you. And, and here's and the thing. A lot's going to hurt you, but we don't want to deal with it. If it is something like the Louisville case, like the NCAA would have preferred the Louisville case to just That's disappear. Right. They, they did not want they the headache. Don't want, they don't want coaches paying prostitutes to recruits out in the open. No. They would rather nobody in the public ever find out about that. They yeah. don't want to investigate that any more than you want them to. And, and he, if they already know about it, they're probably telling them, hey, Get rid of this. Stop this. Stop this and get rid of it and yep. make sure nobody else finds out about it and do whatever you got to do yep. to make sure nobody finds out about it. Because if it comes out, we're going to have to kill you. Yep. Like, we're going to have to. Now, they didn't it, like, kill Louisville. They didn't kill him. But they should have. But they, they Well, they, they killed the guy well, the that was fall, involved with the it. The fall guy. But if, if there is no fall guy at Ole Miss, like if it is an entirely institutional thing. Well, the fall guy is going to be Hugh. And, and that's, I mean, that's what it'll have to now, be. But now, they, but, the fall, any, for any new allegations here's the that problem. come out, the fall guy's going to be here. They have to get him on board with it, and they didn't pay him anything. No, they don't. They don't have to get him on board with it because they have all his phone records. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, have, right. they have everything, all his dirty secrets that are probably going to come to light at some point in time. Yeah. But no one's going to find Hugh credible. Yeah, you're right. No one, no one on the planet's going to – and then if he has all these calls to escorts himself – even if it was for personal use and they find out the escorts were for recruits, it's real easy to say, well, Hugh did it. He's the one that called them all. Yeah. Hugh did it. And there, there you go. I don't think the NSA wants to open another investigation. I don't think they want to spend any more time in Oxford than they've already and spent. Lord, no. They have crushed that program just being present. We oh, had, yeah. We had some guys talking about that last week on with us. And and I I just think they're done. Yeah. I, I think you're That's probably right. That's my opinion. Right. I might be way off on that. And but both of us may be way off on this. Yeah. Like, it, there may be nothing to this. It may just be trying to fight with Thomas Mars. But you know, it seems like if it was something, no. if, I, if there I was know. nothing there, if they, in a if, lawsuit, see, I just, I think in a lawsuit like this, if you have a high dollar attorney trying to stick it to you, you make him fight for every piece of evidence he wants. And I also think there's a chance if they're right on this stuff then they got bad legal counsel to begin with. They should have never given the first phone records over. You've reason to be their coach. Yeah. No, no, they should have never done that to begin with. Yeah. And and a lot of that I put on their legal counsel. Yeah. They should have well, they remember should have used the, this argument. The head of their legal counsel is Lee Tyner and, and Ole Miss fans hated him for a long time because they thought that he was the one that was riding around Oxford with the NCAA finding stuff out. They thought that he was working with the NCAA. I, I don't know anything about the guy. I do think that they've had a lot of missteps just from the outside looking in, reading about the investigation, following as closely as we followed it. Well, And like Bruce Lloyd I said with us. I think they've us, made a lot of yeah, mistakes. Like, like Bruce Lloyd was telling us, um, he, like, he explained it as a lot of their response was based on the character of Hugh Freeze. That's it. And he thought from the beginning, like, I don't think the NCAA pays attention to that crap. Yeah, they don't. That's a bad argument. Yeah. Nobody cares. Even if he didn't have this dirty skeleton that came out of the closet, that doesn't help you on trial date. Yeah. You have to have something of substance to bring up. You can't just put a choir boy up there and say, but look at him. He's never done anything wrong. Like, he wouldn't do this because he's never done That's this. That's a terrible defense. We've talked about this. Yeah. I don't I don't know anything about their legal counsel. They're, they're probably great. I just think from the outside looking in, I, I don't think they've handled this well. No, I don't think so at all. And at what point in time do you change legal counsel? Right now, you can't. Why? You can yeah. fire your attorney in the middle of a trial. Why not? Yeah, because you can't fire him in the middle of an NCAA trial. Because you can't push an NCAA trial back. Oh, no. The like new guy's got to step in and just pick up where they left off. I know. Here's and, all and, our information. And we're very, very close. Like, here's another thing. It We're on, you know, this is August 1st, and they still haven't released the NCAA's response that they had in hand last Monday. 
Like, are you kidding me? You know, if, if there was anything that was good for Ole Miss in that NCAA response, they would have released that by now. Oh, absolutely. No, you know, it, it, the, the whole thing, The same yes. thing we talked about with Hand at Alabama. If if it was positive, they would have told us. Yep. So that means we just work under the assumption that it was it's all wrong. It's all bad. Yeah, I agree. All right, that's going to wrap us up today. You guys go to the website, winningcureseverything.com. Check out that article I was just telling you about. It is up there right now. Uh, winningcureseverything.com. We're on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. Give us a like there and follow us over at uh, over at Facebook. Follow us on Twitter, at winningcures. You can follow myself, Gary, W-C-E. You can follow Chris. Chris B. Giannini, C-H-R-I-S-B-G-I-A-N-N-I-N-I. You can also email the show, winningcureseverything at gmail.com. You can subscribe to, download, and review the podcast iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for you to leave reviews on the iTunes page. We'll be very grateful. We are very grateful. Just appreciate We, we may even put up a, a prize or something pretty soon. Like we may do a gift like a fifty dollar gift card or something. Ooh, like something something serious if we can if we can get enough people to review that thing because uh like there, there's good things that happen. It moves us up the charts if you leave reviews. It's not just subscribers. It does help a lot. It he- the reviews help a lot. So leave a review on iTunes for us. Tell your friends. All that. Them. Share it out on all your social media. Like I said, it's iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, all your favorite podcast apps, and we are on Local X on Tuesdays and Fridays at 9 a.m. That's localxradio.com or the Local X app. For Chris Giannini, I'm Gary Seegers. Thank you for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Until Friday. Have a good one, guys. Hey, this is Gary Seegers, host of The Stage View. Make sure and tune in to Local X's first morning sports show, Winning Cures Everything, with myself and Chris Giannini every Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m. Check out the site and grab the podcast at winningcureseverything.com.